everybody. I have a question for you before I begin. Don't I sound much better singing with this mask on? <laughs> I really think I do. I think I am just, just so good with that. Um, like I said earlier, Isaac had double booked himself and uh, thanks to my wife saying, don't you think you should check and see if he's coming? <laughs> so about 7.30 last night I text him and he says, oh, oh no, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry I double booked myself. So um, this isn't the fastest I've ever got a sermon together. The one time Jim walked in and after a Bible class and says, I could teach Bible class, but I can't preach today. That was probably the fastest I've ever had to do one. So um, as the text read, 2 Peter 3.18 and 1 Peter 2.2, 2, Christians are expected to grow. We're not expected to just, ugh, you know, just sit there. We're expected to grow because growth is a sign of life and only living things grow. Have you ever seen a tree that just has a branch that's died? There's no life to it. Well, that's the same way with a Christian. If you have no growing left in you, you're just gonna be that branch that has no life to it. Um, let me get my phone chart up here. All right. I wanna take a look at John 15. John 15, verses 2 through 8. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it ab abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like branches that withers, and branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So fruit, bearing fruit for God is an essential part of us growing in, in grace and knowledge. We need to grow spiritually constantly. It doesn't matter whether you became a Christian when you were 13, whether you were 20, whether you were 50. And it doesn't matter if you're 88 years old like Roy. He still is growing as a Christian. I want to just, have you read a verse? We've talked about this before. Just think back. You read a verse probably 45 times, and the 46th time you t found a different thing meaning from it. That's growing. That's growing in grace and knowledge. And it's essential that we have the fruits. In this lesson, we're going to focus on three essential things to growth, to grow. First, we need a favorable environment. Some cl climates are not conducive to healthy growth. I bet you if you plant a palm tree in Antarctica, it's not going to grow. And I bet you if you plant watermelon in the middle of the desert, it's not going to grow. So our environment is very important to us. And some environments are not helpful to grow spiritually. If we want to look at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15.33. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Now this is a tough one. I can easily stand up here and I can tell you, Christians should avoid drinking, drugs, and I can give you a long list of what Christians should avoid. But when you get down to this, bad company ruins good morals. When you become a Christian, there's times in your life that you're gonna to have to leave friends that you don't wanna leave because they're not living the life. And no matter what you've done to help them, they've not changed. And the rougher thing about that is, and I know it's for me, is I don't, attend certain family functions because I know what's going to happen there. 
and that's hard. That is very, very difficult. But we have a, made a commitment to put God first in our life. So in order for us to grow and have grace and knowledge, we've got to make those decisions that we're not going to allow that to happen. Now, as babes in Christ, I'll give you the best thing you can do to know. That is to associate with other Christians. I've given up a lot of friends in my lifetime, but I've made a whole lot of new friends that's been much better off for me, being in Christ. Now, I've used this example before. It uses here, lambs are safer in the sheepfold. I think I've used this example about the coyotes on my stepfather's farm where the mother cows make a circle, the baby cows stay in the middle as the coyotes, and the bull goes around the circle protecting the herd. Well, if you're a babe in Christ, a new Christian, you need that protection of the, of the sheepfold or of the cows. You need to be there. You need to protect, you know, one, because you need to be protected. Two is learning. Have you ever looked at a baby lamb or calf or something? They, they actually don't know how to do very much. They walk around and lambs, I'm sure eat grass and there's certain grasses they don't eat because it's poisonous. So the mother kind of teaches the baby what to do. So that's part of it is learning. And then also you're under watchful shepherds. If your congregation has an elders, they're to look out for you. But the most important person you're under is Christ Jesus. If you're in the fold and you stay in the fold, you're going to be under Christ, and he's going to take care of you. I want to look at Ephesians 3.21. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God is glorified in what? In the church. Now, this building we know is not the church. It's the people inside the building that makes up this congregation that's a church. So God is glorified in the environment that you keep yourself in. If you put yourself in an environment that is bad for you, you're not glorifying God anymore. If you go to those parties that you know you shouldn't go to, or if you go to gamble somewhere you know you shouldn't go to, you're not glorifying God any longer. You, your environment that you keep yourself in is what glorifies God. Now, the next one we're going to talk about wholesome food. More and more the value of good nutrition has been recognized, like cheeseburgers, pizza, filet mignon. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I have been told if it tastes good, spit it out and don't eat it. So, my doctor would say, you know, you eat a lot more kale and spinach and salads and, you know, things like that. Now, me and myself, I would prefer the pizza and the prime rib and the cheeseburgers, but I have to eat more salads. I, I'll be honest, I actually ate three salads this week, past week. That's amazing. Now, they were chef salads, so they had meat and cheese and all that good stuff on it. But still, Carolyn made some wonderful salads. But if we want to look at Psalms 19, Psalms 19, 9 through 10. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and droppings of the honeycomb. The Word of God is a Christian spiritual food. That's a Bible. That is our spiritual food. I heard this said once, and I don't know, remember who said it, but the Bible is shallow enough to walk through and not get your shoes wet, but deep enough for you to ground in. So as a new Christian, you get the milk from our text. You know what you have. You've heard the Word. You believe the Word. You've repented. You've you've uh, said that Jesus is the Son of God and you've been baptized. Now comes on your life. And that's where you got to go to from there. And as a babe, 
that's when you start digging into the scriptures and start learning and start growing and start being part of that is that you start moving towards what we will find in Hebrews 5 10 and 14 Hebrews 5 verses 10 through 14 being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek above this we have much to say and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing for through by for though by this time you ought to be teachers you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God you need milk not solid food for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child but solid food is the mature of those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice of distinguishing good from evil. As you mature as a Christian, you move from that milk to what most of the time we call meat. That's the heart of the scriptures. That's digging into them. And I don't, I will tell you right now, I don't care how old you are, you're still gonna be finding something to dig into. Now, I will say, every time I teach a class, I learn more than the people I'm teaching, I'm sure. Because you're digging into the scriptures. Or every time I preach, I learn more than that, than the people. Because I dig into, dig into it a little deeper than what I sometimes am able to present. But we, as mature Christians, need to keep maturing. That's growing in knowledge. We've got to do that. If you want to look at Acts 20, Acts 20, verse 32. Acts 20, 32. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sacrificed. I converted no one's silver or gold. I'm sorry, I should have stopped there before I went into 33. This verse 32. I'm going to read it again so I'm, I'm clear to everyone. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give to you the inheritance among all those who are sacrificed. That's verse 32. The word builds you up. Now, I, I remember when I was a young kid, I thought I was the cat's meow because I got this big white tub full of 100 or 220 Legos. It was amazing. I built everything. I built houses. It came with two windows and a door so I could build a house. And I built it up step by step. I built that up all the way. And I thought, boy, I am really, really awesome. And I built walls for fortresses for my army men and all this stuff. But the way, reason I'm saying that is each time you take the word, you're putting another block in your life. You're putting another piece of that puzzle together as you read the word and study it. Now I made some exorbitantly what I thought was tremendous houses. Compared to the Legos they have today, I did nothing. Because they have everything laid out. But back then, as I'm dating myself, it was awesome. It was great to have that. But it, it's so much greater to have the Bible and to look at things in the Bible and to build yourself up through that. Christians grow and thrive spiritually when they take advantage of every feeding opportunity. What do I mean by that? I mean attending services and Bible class. I can't wait till we get back to having Bible classes again because I think that's where we really grow as Christians is in Bible classes. Um, Northwest has tremendous training classes in late February, early March. If you're able to take advantage of those on Monday nights, they're great. Uh, the men's retreat that we have, the one that Northwest has, and there's so many others out there are great. And listening to people that are very knowledgeable about certain things. I don't know of anyone more knowledgeable about the history and the restoration movement than David Kenny. I just don't know of anyone more that knows more about that. And having the honor of hearing him present that at the men, one of the men's retreats I attended 
was really awesome to hear him talk about the church and, and, where, and how it was formed and, and everything. It was, it was wonderful. But we had many, many feeding opportunities. And one of the very best feeding opportunities we have is fellowship meals. Now, I'm not only saying that because of meals and food and everything else, but it's time that we sit around and we talk with one another and we laugh together. And nine times out of ten, there's going to be spiritual something spiritual in that type of setting. And it's really well, it's really awesome to be here till 1.30, 2 o'clock um, with one another. Clean up isn't always the greatest, and I'm tearing stuff up the stairs is not good, or down the back <laughs> stairs. That's not the best part of it, you know. I fell down the stairs and really hurt myself <laughs> a few months ago. So that was kind of fun, giving myself a good concussion. But being there for that feeding is a really good thing. We should take every opportunity for that. The last point, point number three, is proper exercise. This too has been recognized as essential part to good health and long life. Now I'm talking about PlayStation, moving that recliner up and down. That's some good exercise. No, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have strong thumbs, let me tell you. Some of the strongest thumbs in the world. But walking, um, they have those underwater, I see where in athletics training, they have underwater treadmills for players to get back healthier. Um, aerobic, or being aerobics underwater, different things, whatever your exercise your doctor has you to do, it's very good to you. But I want to read 1 Timothy 4, starting in verse 7. Have nothing to do with irrelevant, silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, Godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The Bible stresses spiritual exercise. Now what am I talking about when I say that? It means your brain and your heart. We gotta train our brains and our heart and exercise them in spiritual matters. In Philippians 2.12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in much presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Who's responsible for your salvation? I'm responsible for mine. Andy, you're responsible for yours. Carolyn's responsible for her. We're all responsible for our own salvation. And sometimes that can be very hard. We are to work out our salvation. Work, when you hear it, doesn't always mean pleasant things. I mean, there's times that we're gonna be down on our knees with sweat pouring off of our brow, fighting for our salvation. There's gonna be times that Satan has surrounded us with so much that we need to work severely, severely over time to maintain our salvation. It is tough. It's going to be tough. So that's why we need to have that exercise in our minds and our hearts ready for that time where that work comes. Next, Hebrews 12, 1. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lie aside every weight and sin with clinging so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Did you ever think of your salvation and exercise? We're going to have to run a race. We're running it right this second. I'm not talking a physical race. I'm talking a spiritual race. We are running a race. Some of us have a marathon ahead of us. Some of us have a 5K. Some of us have a sprint. But we're all running that race, and we're running it against two, Satan, to fight for our growth and endurance in God. We need to grow in God and how we run that race. Have you ever ran a mile? 
in high school I ran a mile. I may not look like it now, but I ran a 620 mile. I'm so proud of myself when I was 18 years old. I ran a 620 mile. Why? I had to run a 620 mile in order to play basketball. So I ran a 620 mile. Actually it was 617, <clears throat> if I may be proud of myself. But I ran that race. But what did I do leading up to that? I trained. I trained and trained and trained. And when the coach, when I had a half a mile left and he says you have so many seconds left, do I forget what it was, I put everything I had into it and collapsed as I crossed the line. And to be honest with you, I vomited it for about six hours afterwards because I pushed myself so hard. Well, here, we need to spiritually push ourselves so hard that we're running as fast as we can and doing the very best we can to run that race with, for God. Now, 1 Timothy 6.12. First Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight for faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called and are, and are about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Have you ever thought about your uh, growth in the process of fighting? We're going to have to fight. We're going to have to fight the greatest thing we possibly can fight, and that's ourselves. We don't always want to do what God wants us to do. So we're going to have to fight that. Now, if, you see, if you've seen boxers, besides the heavyweight boxers, but the lightweight and middleweight, they're in good shape. I mean, they're out there just flailing away. Fighting hard and training hard. I don't know how many times you jump a jump rope, but they do. I remember back, I remember jumping what they call the sand jump rope in basketball. It was this long jump rope that was made of rubber and filled with sand. So the more times you ran, the longer it got and the heavier it got. That's all training. Training for that fight that we were going to have, that battle, those 20 battles a year that we had on the basketball court. But here, we are at a spiritual fight with not only Satan, but ourselves to continue to grow. James 4, 7 says, basically, resist the devil. Now, why is that under exercise? I'm telling you, it's going to take a lot of strength to resist the devil. Remember when Jesus came out of the wilderness or the desert and, he, and the devil was standing there and said, Hey, if you're really the Son of God, turn that rock into bread. And Jesus said, No. For every word that comes out of my Father's mouth is my, spear, is my food. Paraphrasing. But he knew to resist the devil. If we look at those points, and sometimes we may, we may do a sermon on it because we haven't for a long time, how the devil tempted Jesus and he resisted constantly. Why? Because he had just been through 40 days of exercise. And that spiritual exercise for his mind and his heart because he turned from being God into man. So he needed that time for his exercise to occur. So we have that. Now here I'm going to challenge you to accept every spiritual challenge to strengthen and flex your spiritual muscles. I'm going to challenge each and every one of us to do things to make this congregation better. The exercises that we need to. Whether that's inviting people, whether that's getting involved in teaching, whether that's being part of visiting the sick, whatever it may be, there is ways for each and every one of us to spiritually exercise and flex our spiritual muscles and grow from that. Now the rules of physical health and spiritual health are the same. You have the environment, you have the food, and the exercise. God wants us to be interested in both. But spiritual health pays not only in this temporary life, but in your eternal life. And that's what we need to really focus on is our eternal life as this is only a temporary situation for us. And I praise God for that. 
If you're having trouble in any way, shape, or form this morning, please come as we stand and sing.